thank you so much for that kind introduction. I don't usually get to be introduced by a fellow Canadian, so it's a particular treat. Let me take out my computer here. And as you've heard, tonight is going to be a conversation. I'm going to seed the conversation um, with some thoughts, and then we will be having a conversation on stage after that. You are going to be able to offer us your ideas and questions, and you can do this if you are online as well as if you are in the room. However, if you are listening to recording afterwards, you are out of luck, no questions for you. So you have to be live to get that part of it. And then afterwards, as you've probably heard, we're going to be having more conversations in small groups because that truly is, in my opinion, the way to seed action. How do humans ever do anything together without communicating, right? But we take it so for granted that we often just skip right over it whenever we're talking about action. But if you think about it, conversations have seeded every aspect of social change that we have experienced in our modernized society. And I'm truly convinced that that's exactly what we need to spur climate action today. So starting with the issue at hand, what is going on? When I ask people, and I talk to a lot of people around the world, in fact, most of my presentations are virtual. I give almost 90% of my presentations virtually, and I only travel in person when I have a bundle. And I have a bundle in Boston. We're up to, I think, 22 events <laughs> in four days. That is a hefty bundle. It is only broken by the record that I set last week, which was 31 events in New York City for Climate Week in four days. Yes, if you want to know how I do it, the answer is dark chocolate. Also, maybe some tea. Not a coffee person. Um, when I speak with people around the world, though, mostly virtually, I often ask people, in fact, for the last two years, I've been asking people very regularly a simple question, which is when I say climate change, how do you feel? I have asked this question of young people and older people. I've asked doctors and healthcare professionals. I've asked artists and architects. I've asked scientists and people of faith. And no matter who I ask, you couldn't tell the difference between their answers. I get the same answers no matter who I'm speaking to. And I just pulled this one as an example for you. When I say climate change, how do you feel? And people can answer any word they want. I put no restriction on that, other than I do have a filter for bad language because I do speak to students occasionally. The poop emoji makes it past the filter, but nothing else does. <laughs> None of that here, because this was not high school or middle school students. But no matter who I'm speaking to, the same words show up. Concerned, scared, anxious, devastated. Hopeless, sad, depressed, overwhelmed. And yes, there was a poo there, too. Who were these people? I'm pretty sure this was a group of researchers in Switzerland which is a pretty advanced country when it comes to climate action. No matter who we are around the world, we, this is how we feel when the topic of climate change comes up. And the first thing I want to say is, if this is how you feel, if you see yourself in any of these answers here, you're not alone. In fact, most of us are with you. And the science is with you, too. When we look at what is happening to our planet, the fact that we are conducting an unprecedented experiment, as far back as we can go in human history, as far back as we can go in the history of our planet, well before human history, we've never seen this much carbon going into the atmosphere this quickly. And this is our home. So if you feel worried and anxious, the science backs you up. There is every reason to feel worried and anxious. It's not only about what we're doing to the climate system, what about our biodiversity? Did you know that almost every other breath you take takes in oxygen that comes from tiny phytoplankton in the ocean? Nature doesn't need us. We need nature. Today, when we look at the changes that are happening in our planet that are affecting us and they're affecting every aspect of the natural world, we see that warming is unprecedented in human history. And in the past, whenever it's warmed as quickly as it's warming today, it's only happened a few times. And each of those times has been characterized by a word. And you know what that word is? Extinctions. Things are not looking good. And so if you feel worried or anxious that we have 8 billion people on the planet and an $85 trillion economy, that is a rational response to the science. 
It is not being sensitive. It is not being overly anxious. It is being rational. Now, we often refer to this issue as global warming because the figure I just showed you before shows the average temperature of the planet and how it's increasing. But when we call it global warming, and in places like Boston or Toronto where I'm from, or even Texas where I live, I've lived in Lubbock for many years and it snows at least once a year there, every time it's cold, people say, well, it's cold outside. Where's global warming now? Have you heard that? You probably have, right? And it's true that you or I can't feel or experience the warming of the entire planet. That's beyond our experience as humans. But what I've realized is we are experiencing the impacts, every single one of us, but we're experiencing them in a slightly different way, a way that I call global weirding. Why do I call it that? Well, a number of years ago, I was standing in line at church to pick up my son from Sunday school. And the man behind me said, do you mind if I ask you a question? And I was like, well, we're standing here, not going anywhere. <laughs> Why not? And he said, do you feel like our weather is getting weirder? And I said, well, that is a very good description of what's happening. I said, yes, I know as a scientist that our heat wave season is getting longer and our heat waves are getting stronger and more intense. I know that wildfires are burning much greater area today than they were 50 or 100 years ago. I know that droughts are getting longer and stronger. I know that hurricanes are powering up overnight into a category three or four storm, and they're dumping much more rain. I know that atmospheric rivers are stronger and heavy rainfall and flood risk is increasing. So I said, yeah, it is getting weirder. And he said, I knew it. I've lived here for 30 years, and I knew that something was different. And so I started to talk to people all around. And whenever I said that, people were like, yes, it is getting weirder. That's exactly what's happening. So that was what was already happening. And then along came 2023. And we're not done yet. The worst wildfire on season in Canada, where almost every town in the Northwest Territories had to be evacuated one by one. The horrible fires in Maui the floods in Libya with well over 10,000 deaths, the seawater near Florida reaching hot tub temperatures and scientists frantically hauling coral out of the water trying to save it, the warmest summer on record, and as one of my colleagues, Heidi, just posted on LinkedIn today, I saw it, so I grabbed it to put it in here. She said, I woke up to see the first glacier we ever studied in Colombia was found dead yesterday. And for scientists, they have a relationship with their glaciers. So what are we already seeing? I've done a lot of work in the area. I was actually the lead scientist on the Northeast Climate Impact Assessment led by the Union of Concerned Scientists back in 2007. I've done work for Boston Logan Airport looking at the integrity of their runways in a warmer world. I've done work for Cambridge looking at changes in flood risk. And so the simulations I originally did looked at how many hot summer days we had here in Boston in the past, 1970 to 2000. The orange is above 90, and the red is above 100. So in the past, we had about a week and a half above 90 and one day above 100. Then I, 15 years ago, simulated what conditions would be like in the 20s and 30s. And guess what? That's the present today. Here we are. This is our summer. This is June, July, and August on the calendar. And this is how many days over 90 degrees and 100 we're having. And then I simulated the future. And this is what a summer in Boston looks like. We found that Massachusetts summer would be essentially sliding all the way down to South Carolina-like conditions if we don't tackle this issue. You'd have to be putting some sugar in your tea. And that's the least of your worries. Personally, I actually prefer sugar in my tea. But the point is, is the hot and humid conditions that people normally cope with in the Carolinas in summer, that's not what Boston was built for. Boston's infrastructure was not built for that. And then look at sea level rise. This is a Google map of Boston, which you will probably recognize. And superimposed over it are the areas that would be below the annual flood level if sea level continues to rise for the next 25 years the way it did for the last 25 years, which is accelerating exponentially. So this is affecting us. 
and it's affecting us at an increasing pace. Back in the 1980s, when NOAA first began to track the number of billion dollar weather and climate disasters, there was one every four months. Now, accounting for the value, or for how the value of the dollar changes over time, of course, by the 2010s, there was one every 2.8 weeks. This year, one every two weeks, and we're not finished with the year. Why does this matter? It matters because it affects our food, it affects our water, it affects the air that we breathe, it affects the buildings and roads and infrastructure that we use. People often talk about saving the planet, as if we could somehow just orbit around in outer space without the planet. The planet doesn't need us, we need the planet. It is quite literally about saving us. And I put an asterisk on there specifically because when I say us, often people assume I'm just talking about humans. I'm not, I'm talking about all of us living things. We, none of us, are prepared for and ready to adapt for the magnitude of changes that we're confronting today. And again, nature doesn't need us, we need it. So we often think, and this is from a little YouTube series I have called Global Weirding, we often think, if people just knew the facts, surely they'd spring into action, right? So we just need to tell them about more polar bears, more ice sheets, more sea level rise, more global average temperature, and that'll do it. Well, welcome to the scientists who've been doing that for 50 years. How's that worked out? People are worried. Like I said, and this was two years ago, I think this number is up over three quarters now, most Americans are worried. So check, worried. But 50% feel hopeless and don't know where to start. And this is even worse, only 8% are activated. What is our goal? Is our goal to make the whole world worried? Well, we're almost there. We're doing really well with that goal. If you look at a map of the world, most of it is worried. But you could have the whole world worried, and if they feel hopeless and helpless and don't know what to start and they're not activated, nothing's going to happen. You might as well be unworried and ignorant rather than worried and don't know what to do. So what's the goal here? The goal is we need to know what to do. Now, when we're worried, we often try to seize on one big red easy button. So you will see headlines, and I've copied a few of them here, proof that these exist. Here's the two silver bullets that will restore our climate. Oh, no, 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 here's the one silver bullet that will restore the climate. But no, 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 that's the wrong silver bullet. Here's the real silver bullet. So you see all these signs and headlines about silver bullets. Here's the bad news, there is no silver bullet. If you read a headline saying there is, it's wrong. But here's the good news. There's a lot of silver buckshot. What does that mean? It means we have solutions of all types for everyone to get involved in. You might be working for a city. There's a whole set of solutions for you. You might work for a small business. There's a whole set for you. You might be a student. There's a whole set of solutions for you, for students and schools. You might be part of a faith community. There's a whole set of solutions there. There's lots of solutions. And the way I like to describe the solutions is using a swimming pool. The swimming pool, like the one I grew up with in my backyard, is an above ground swimming pool. And it is a metaphor for the atmosphere. It had just enough water in it so our toes could just touch the ground. It had just the right amount of heat trapping gases in the atmosphere to keep us just the right temperature for human civilization. The last six to 8,000 years has been perfect for human civilization. But around about the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, we stuck a giant hose in the pool, and we've been turning that hose up every year. We turned it down 7% the first year of the pandemic, and then we turned it right back up again. The hose are our human emissions of heat-trapping gases. 75% come from digging up and burning coal, gas, and oil, fossil fuels. 25% come from deforestation and large-scale agriculture. So there's three categories of climate solutions here. Number one, the obvious, turn off the hose, right? We need to turn off the hose. What's number two? I mentioned this is an above-ground swimming pool, and that means it has a drain. The drain is the way to take carbon out of the atmosphere. Carbon itself is not bad. 
We just have too much of it in the wrong place. We want more of it back in the soil and ecosystems where we want it and less of it in the atmosphere. So investing in nature, we could take up to a third of a carbon out of the atmosphere. And that's where a lot of our work at the Nature Conservancy focuses on, is making the drain bigger and also ensuring that as we turn off the hose, we don't make the problems greater. So for example, we want to make sure that we're not cutting down virgin forests to put up solar panels. Or we're not putting wind farms on migratory pathways for birds. We can make the drain bigger, but there's one more thing we have to do. The level of water in the pool is so high now that our toes don't touch the ground. So what do you have to do? We have to learn how to swim. That is resilience and adaptation. Learning how to swim, learning how to not only survive, but thrive in a warmer world. So let me give you a couple of examples to dig down just one level deeper. When people talk about turning off the hose, they often say clean energy. And it's true, clean energy is a big part of this. But the cheapest form of energy is the energy we don't use. Efficiency. What about not being so wasteful with heating and cooling our buildings and all the energy that we just waste? 67% of it, actually. Better land use and agriculture. Changing our behavior so we don't need so much. And then there's a little, 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 little tiny bit where they can divert some of the water from the hose, a few drops, and then put it back underground. That's carbon capture and storage. So there's this great resource called Project Drawdown. I'm not sure if you've seen it before. But it is a clearinghouse of climate solutions. So if you want to know what categories do we have in the efficiency, what, category, what kind of solutions do we have in clean energy, what solutions do we have in agriculture, you go there and it lists them all. And you click on these pictures and it gives you little articles that you can read. It's awesome. So there's all kinds of efficiency solutions from your smart thermostat to efficient trucks. Then there's the climate solutions that replace fossil fuels with clean energy. Not just wind and solar, but heat pumps, electrifying your home, and even some really high-tech stuff to decarbonize industry. Solutions that prevent deforestation and reduce agricultural emissions. Solutions that make the drain bigger. Now here, people usually say, oh, well, clearly tree planting, right? Tree planting is number three on the list. Why is that? Because the first most important thing we need to do is protect what we already have. Then we need to restore what we have that's become degraded or under stress, then regenerate what we don't have anymore. That's where the planting comes in. But then there's also climate smart agriculture, turning our agriculture from a, a source into a sink of carbon and fertilizing our crops by doing so through regenerative ag practices like no-till agriculture and cover crops. And then there's a few tiny, tiny drops that we can also take out of the atmosphere through directly capturing them through complex and expensive chemical processes. What do we need? We need it all. There is no silver bullet. But when we put all of this into practice, we see phenomenal results, like helping countries that have crippling national debt but huge, unique areas of biodiversity to refinance their national debt and use the interest that they've saved to set aside marine and terrestrial protected areas and to build climate resilience. It's phenomenal. Galapagos Islands are being protected this way. Barbados is doing it. Belize has done it. The Seychelles have done it. We have dozens of these deals. They call them debt for nature deals, but we need thousands, not dozens. Agricultural solutions, my goodness, you can see there's so many of these here, from changing what we eat and how we eat it and whether we waste our food or not, because we're so wasteful with food, too. We waste almost half our food. If food waste were its own country, it would be the fourth biggest emitter of heat-trapping gases in the world. We can all reduce food waste, but then there's all kinds of ways to improve the way that we grow and manage our food that improve yields, improve people's lives, clean up our water, reduce the use of fertilizers, and more. Then there's the last one. We have to figure out how to swim. And there, there is so much we can do. I was meeting with a research group over at Northeastern today, and so many of those incredibly smart people are working on how can we make our cities more resilient? How can we engineer our built environment so it swims, metaphorically speaking? Technological adaptation, how can we be smarter with what we have? 
How can we use ecosystems and nature to help us adapt? How can we adapt our society to protect people who are most vulnerable, to ensure that there's people watching out for them when disasters hit? How can we do all of this? I've been working with a research group just up the road from you for over 10 years. The Infrastructure Climate Network is hosted by the University of New Hampshire in Durham, so not very far away. And we've been working to figure out, first in New England, then across the US, and now internationally, how we can equip our transportation infrastructure to swim, so to speak, in a warmer world. We can use technology to help make us safer and more efficient early warning systems, disruptive tech for climate resilience, citizen science, and my favorite, we can use nature. Nature in cities helps keep us cool during heat waves. Nature in cities help takes up water when it would otherwise flood. Nature in cities provides a place for people to be outdoors with their friends and their family that improves our physical and our mental health. Nature in cities filters our air from the pollutants that damage our lungs, leading to millions of premature deaths around the world every year. Oh, and nature in cities also takes up carbon. And it also provides haven for biodiversity. You see, there's these win-win-win solutions. When you look at these solutions, the turning the hose off, making the drain bigger, and learning how to swim, and people say, well, which one do we need? My answer is yes. <laughs> we need them all. And here's the good news, when we implement these solutions, they actually make sense. Investing in nature makes sense. Investing in clean energy makes sense. And it's not, not you know, environmentalists or activists alone saying this, it's Oxford University, it's scientists, it's peer-reviewed publications showing that this is real. I love looking at climate solutions that also give us clean air and clean water that also protect us from disasters, that also improve our physical and mental health, like I mentioned, that provide more, not less affordable energy. Did you know solar energy is the cheapest form of electricity humans have ever known now? That reduces rather than increasing the inequalities that climate change is growing, that creates healthy ecosystems and foodscapes because we need to be growing food to feed people. These solutions give us a more stable world. And so at this point, and if you do a deeper dive into climate solutions, you get to this point even faster, you're like, all right, here's the last question. How do I get this thing going faster, right? If this is really that good, it is. If it's really that essential that we do it, it is. If it's really that bad, if we don't, it is. Why don't we go faster? And after a summer like the one we just had, I hear that even more because people are like, if the wildfires on Maui won't convince people to move, what will? If the orange smoke in Boston and New York City and Washington DC won't convince people to move, what will? But what they don't realize is it's not about being worried. Most people are worried, and I pulled up Suffolk County right here, so you can see how Suffolk County compares to the rest of the US. These are results from the Yale Program on Climate Communications polling, and as you can see, most people agree it's happening and most people are worried. But then you ask people, do you think it will affect you personally, turns blue, which is less than 50% of people saying yes. And then here is something amazing. They asked one more question. And the answer to this question was darker blue. Do you ever talk about it? Remember what I said when we were starting? How do humans ever do anything together? It's by talking about it. And I'm not talking about dumping the science on people or the polar bears or the ice sheets, unless you are a polar bear living on an ice sheet, in which case, yes. I'm talking about here and now. I'm talking about the people and places and things you love. If you're a hockey fan, talk about how there's no back door, backyard outdoor hockey anymore. If you're not a hockey fan, don't talk about that. Talk about the air pollution and how it was so bad from the wildfire smoke you couldn't let your kids outside to play. Okay, you don't have kids. What if you're a diver? Talk about how the corals are being bleached by the record warm ocean temperatures and we're losing that incredible nursery of the biodiversity of life in the ocean. Whoever you are, there is something that you care about that is already being affected by climate change, I guarantee you. I have started conversations on climate change, not just over the fact that I'm a mother and a scientist 
that I love snow, that I live in Texas, but the fact that I knit, or that I like wine or chocolate, or I, I like beach vacations. You can start anywhere as long as it's directly connected to people's hearts, and don't stop there. You have to connect it to what we can do about it. Because the goal of the conversation is not to beat people upside the head with all your data and facts. The goal is to bring them in and listen to what they care about and see that whoever they are is already the perfect person to care. Exactly who they are with their set of cares, loves, worries, priorities, and concerns, they're the perfect person to care because of who they are. You don't have to make everyone a hockey player, a parent, or a diver to care about climate change. You just have to figure out what they already have and connect that to how climate change is affecting it. But don't stop there. You also have to help them see that they can make a difference. You have to connect. The way I think about it is this. You have to connect the head, all the information we know, to the heart, why we care, to the hands, what we can do about it. That is the magic formula for turning that 70% worried, 8% activated into 70% activated and more. We often picture climate change like a giant boulder with only one or two hands on it. And if I add mine, it won't make a difference. But when we talk about all of the organizations, all of the people, all of the schools, all of the cities, all of the churches, all of the Boy Scout and Girl Scout troops, all of the Rotary Clubs, all of the people whose hands are on that giant boulder, we realize that it is already rolling down the hill in the right direction. And if I add my hand, and if I use my voice to encourage others to add their hand, it will go faster. So when I ask people how they feel about climate change, and I get these answers, and when I explain to them what I talk about in my TED Talk, and what I talk about in my book, Saving Us, and what I've talked about with you a little bit here tonight, which is that we truly do have the power to change our future, I ask them the same question at the end, exact same question. And you cannot tell the difference between the different people I ask this question to. Every time, though, I hold my breath because I'm thinking this time it won't be the same. Every time it's the same. When we understand not only why climate change matters to us, the heart, but what we can do about it, we feel motivated, hopeful, better, a bit better, some people might feel not really better because it takes a while to sink in. It's not like a 30-minute turnaround here, right? But the important point here is it is about doing something. I love ambitious. <laughs> I love empowered. I love challenged, too, and energized. So when we realize that we hold our future in our hand, when we realize a better future is possible, when we realize that we can't get there alone, but I know we can get there together, the only question I have left is, what are we waiting for? Let's do it. Thank you. So now we're going to have our conversation, the first part of the conversation. If you want to, let's see, Tim, are you going to introduce? Yeah, I'll, I'll go ahead. Okay. First of all, let's thank Professor Hayo for that fantastic talk. You can come have a seat right here. So I think we're ready to talk about it. Um, and uh, based on everything we just heard uh, about getting a conversation together, we crafted the rest of the evening to have a discussion. That includes you, uh, and, and we're ready to start. Let me quickly introduce myself. My name is David Sittenfeld. I use the pronouns he and, he and him. And I'm the director of the Center for the Environment here at the Museum of Science. And uh, I think Professor Hayhoe has done a wonderful job of setting the stage for a conversation about how we can connect our brain to our heart and our hands and what we can do about this issue here in Boston and, and beyond. Um, and we're delighted to be joined by someone who is making all of these things happen. And it's Chief uh, Reverend Mary Mariama White Hammond, um, the Chief of Environment, Energy, and Open Space uh, for the city of Boston. I invite uh, Chief White Hammond to come on up and join us, please. Thank you both for being part of this program. Uh, I'm quickly going to introduce uh, Reverend Mariama, and uh, then we'll get started with our program. Born and raised in Boston, Reverend White Hammond has a long history of community activism and empowerment. 
In 2017, she graduated with her Master of Divinity at the Boston University School of Theology, and a year later, founded New Roots AME Church in Dorchester, where she currently pastors. Reverend White Hammond was appointed at the city of Boston, as the City of Boston's Chief of Envi Environment, Energy, and Open Space in April 2021. In this role, she oversees policies and programs on energy, climate change, food justice, historic preservation, and open space. Reverend Mariama uses an intersectional lens in her ecological work, challenging folks to see the connections between immigration and climate change, or the relationship between energy policy and economic justice. So I really uh, appreciated Professor Hayhoe's points about how we really need to talk with each other about this issue. And it really resonates for what we're trying to do through the Center for the Environment that I live here at the museum. We're trying to facilitate learning, collaboration, and decision making among our public audiences and civic leaders and subject matter experts like the two of you. So we've really tried to tailor tonight's agenda in that spirit. So the three of us are gonna have a discussion about what climate change means for our region uh, here in Boston and beyond and how we can plan for it. And I thought that the presentation that we just had did a wonderful job of setting up the challenges we face, but also the opportunities that we uh, have at hand and things that civic planners like Reverend Mariama White Hammond, um, Chief Mariama, Chief Reverend, sorry, she has two titles and I, she told us just to use Rev. Um, <laughs> um, uh, are doing to build resilience. So I have some questions prepared that I'll ask, but also be looking at the questions coming in. And as um, our president, Tim Ritchie, said to the beginning, uh, behind us we have uh, the information on Slido, and we'll all be checking those questions um, from the audience at times and bring those in during our conversation. Um, and after the discussion, we've prepared an experience for you where you can talk together, um, as Professor Hejo said, about planning through resilience through the lens of the city's heat resilience plan, which, as you heard, both of you have had a, a, a sort of hand in shaping in one way or another. I want to start by talking about flooding, though. And as we've heard, we've been seeing more intense downpours here in the Northeast, and along with sea level rise and subsidence, that means increased flood risk for coastal cities like the one we live in here in Boston. Um, Professor Heho, I, I know you led some of the modeling that helped project the risks that we can expect here in Boston from sea level rise in the coming decades, and I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about what those risks look like um, and what that means for different people around the world from sea level rise and extreme precipitation, and here in Boston in particular. So I showed you that map um, where you could see the sea level sort of inching up around Boston. But what we have to realize is it isn't just about the permanent inundation. It's about the fact that when a storm comes along today, there's a lot more water for that storm to push ashore than there was 50 or 100 years ago. So during storms, you're going to see a lot more area flooded from sea level rise than you would just sort of the permanent slow creep. Now, I say slow but it's happening twice as fast now as it was 25 years ago. And that means it's an exponential rise. So it means that the rise that we're gonna see in the next 25 years is gonna be a lot more than what we saw in the last 25 years. So this is something that is really coming up on us and it's putting people in low-lying areas at risk. But then, like you just said, it isn't just about sea level rise, we're seeing flooding too from heavy rainfall events. Now, what's the connection there? We always get storms, but warmer air holds more water vapor. So when a storm comes along today, there's more water vapor for that storm to sweep up and dump on us than there was 50 or 100 years ago. And what happens when you've paved over a whole area and there's nowhere for the water to go, you get a flood. Flooding also, and I'm sure you'll talk about this more, it has some very inherent injustices to it because typically the people who live in the flood zones, which are the quickest to flood, are the ones who couldn't afford to live somewhere else. And we see, due to historic racist practices like redlining, that people have been pushed into the very neighborhoods where it's hottest during heat waves, it's most likely to flood during downpours, and they are the people who have the least access to resources to protect themselves from those risks. And so, like I mentioned, the inequalities we already have in our society are being amplified by these impacts, and that's why it's so important to take that intersectional perspective that you do. Thank you so much, and that's a wonderful transition to bring in um, Reverend White Hammond's work. So Boston is really a leader in this kind of resilience planning, um, and I was wondering if you'd talk a little bit about some of the things that Boston is doing to prepare for this flooding, and in particular, how does a civic planner or an entire department of people um, plan for an uncertain threat because we don't know how much flooding to plan for um, you know, as time goes on? Yeah, so we, we are definitely at risk. We have 47 miles of coastline, and that makes uh, 
for a lot of areas that we need to protect. So I think the, a, a couple things, I mean, as has been raised, that it's not evenly distributed across the city. And um, we will also have issues with rainwater flooding, right? So there, there's also that. But um, there are some neighborhoods that are particularly at risk. Um, I live in the neighborhood of Dorchester. We've seen this. We, I mean, we're already ready. Like Morrissey, we just expect it to flood certain times of the year. Um, East Boston, parts of Charlestown, um, downtown, there's a number of neighborhoods where this is already an issue just during king tides, right? We're not even talking about major floods. Um, and so a couple of things that we have done, any time that we own um, the land, so when you look at Pueblo Lingoni Park, for instance, in um, the North End, or Martins Park um, in, uh, in, the sea, in the seaport, sort of Fort Point area, those are places where we did major renovations, and people probably experienced them mostly because it's one of the few places we have bocce courts in the North End, or in Martins Park, we've designed it to um, meet the needs of children across a wide range of, of spectrum, so blind children, children with autism. So we've really, we really leaned in. But we've also built into those parks um, pretty extensive uh, flooding and uh, resilience measures that actually allow those particular areas either to be raised above the flood plain or to also participate in taking on water so that it doesn't keep flowing back into the neighborhoods. But the challenge is that quite a bit of our coastline, we own some, the state owns some, private folks own some, and so um, we're now in the place in, um, particularly in East Boston, of beginning to say, how do we look at uh, preparing people across different ownership sort of stakes to protect uh, floodplains that don't, because the water doesn't say, oh, this is the end of the city's prop like property line, we'll stop flowing over. That's not how it works, right? And so it's going to require a whole different level of um, collaboration, and we're also working with the Army Corps of Engineers. Now, Really excited for that. Traditionally, the Army Corps has built seawalls. We are hoping to have a collaboration that says there are other options beyond seawalls. Because I think, you know, as Professor Hayhoe mentioned, uh, there's not just, some of our neighborhoods that are really vulnerable are not just vulnerable to climate change. They're also vulnerable to housing insecurity. They're also vulnerable to insufficient amounts of open space. And so, we are trying to address climate change, but in a way that also improves the quality of life for people. So if you can build a park that 90% of the time host farmers markets and baseball games and track meets, but also will take water on and prevent it from flooding the neighborhood, then we've not only protected people from climate change, but we've provided the kind of beautiful um, amenities and possibilities in our communities that we always deserved, and in some instances, we did not adequately make sure that every neighborhood had access to those kinds of resources. So we are both trying to address the climate crisis, but also saying, can we do things um, in ways that sometimes repair harm that has been done in some communities where not enough investment has been made into the kinds of things that make life more livable. And if I may, you did something there that is so important, and I wanna highlight it for you for your conversations next. You painted a picture of a better future. So you painted a picture of a beautiful green open space with farmer's markets, which I personally love, where kids could go to play their games, where you could go to walk your dog. So you painted that vision, and I was picturing it as you were saying it. And then I was picturing, oh, yeah, so maybe, you know, a couple of weeks a year, it could get, you know, the water it would be covered by water, but then you'd be back to using it as this beautiful place. And that is so important is to come together to co-create a vision of a better future because our brains are not wired to run away from harm long term. We're wired to run away from harm short term. The bear is chasing you. We are wired to move towards something positive long term. And so that vision, that image, we're very visual people and telling stories to go with it, which is what you did so beautifully. That's what we need for people to fight for that change. Well, I carry the picture of that. So that's, 
that vi it, image comes from the park really close to my house, Moakley Park. And we are raising the money and getting started on working on it. And I literally have the map of that park in my bag. And it has gone around the world. It's been to Glasgow. It's been to Montreal. It's been um, to Monterey, Mexico. Because I do really believe that, as you were saying, far too often we are trying to convince people of how terrible climate change will be, we do not have a lack of fear in the world. In fact, there's multiple forms of fear that are, um, are really putting our democracies at risk and really putting our communities at risk. And I think climate change is an amazing opportunity to dream bigger than we ever have before because we recognize how high the stakes are and maybe that's what we need to decide that we'd like to build a world where there isn't racism. And we'd like to build a world where we really center the needs of our children um, above you know, what we can afford or not afford. Um, and I think climate change might be the kind of kick in the butt we need to do better. Thank you both for that. So before we go on to the next question, I just wanted to say that uh, a lot of what you're both talking about connects to the idea of tapping into community knowledge. People know their communities. They know the places that flood. They know the places that get hot. They know the places that you can go um, when one of these vulnerabilities is manifesting itself during one of the extreme ex events we've been talking about. And just want to say that there are opportunities for you to share that knowledge in your community. One example is an app called MyCoast. If you go outside and take a picture of where there's been flooding in your neighborhood, that information goes to civic planners um, who can use that information. Um, and there are other examples of that too. So that's an example of where what you know about your neighborhood um, can really help to have these conversations about how we can make our neighborhoods uh, places where we want to be that are also more resilient. One of the things that came up in the conversation, uh, both a, a question that was sent in and something that you kind of closed the program or your presentation was, was about the sort of magic that exists at the nexus of resilience and mitigation. In other words, there are those things that I think you called them win-win-wins, where we are both hardening um, our, our resilience to these hazards and also reducing our emissions so that we're bending the curve down and facing less of these threats. And so there was a question about this, um, and I was just wondering, you know, one of the things that we learned from the terrible impacts of Hurricane Maria in the Caribbean uh, a few years ago was that there were places where they had installed these microgrids and renewable energy kept the lights on when the extreme weather was happening. Uh, and so I'm just wondering if either one of you can suggest other examples that you're aware of of these co-benefits, where we reduce our greenhouse gas emissions while we build resilience to flooding or other kinds of impacts. Um, I can, for sure. And another hurricane is a good example, or Superstorm, I should say, Superstorm Sandy. So before Superstorm Sandy hit, um, along the Jersey coast and some other areas, they had been restoring coastal wetlands. Coastal wetlands are often threatened by development, and what people don't realize is in addition to being incredible habitat for um, marine ecosystems, they also take up a lot of carbon and they protect from storm surge. And so I saw an estimate of how many millions of dollars in property loss, and it was in the hundreds of millions of, prop of dollars in property loss have been avoided because of the coastal wetland restoration that had already happened before Superstorm Sandy. And in fact, you said earlier, you know, the flood doesn't say, well, that's where the city ends and that's where the, you know, the private ownership takes over. But the flood definitely says that's where the coastal wetlands end. <laughs> and that's where the private property with no coastal wetlands takes over. So that's an example of a win-win-win. And then the other one I mentioned is, and that we both mentioned, is um, the greening of urban neighborhoods. There's so many wins, like you would need two hands to count the wins on those types of solutions. And what you'll see is a common thread is multiple wins usually improve people's health. They usually address inequities. They usually involve nature. And they help us with climate change, almost like the icing on the cake at that point. Yeah, I think oh, I, I really appreciate that. I think um, that really resonates for me. I think one of the things we've also been trying to do is um, to think about climate resilience, but to think about other forms of resilience too. So I use the example, um, my church was working on a project before the pandemic, and 
we were trying to poll people in Dorchester about what they felt and thought about climate change. And we um, have been using the terms around displacement because it was, that's a conversation people are really having, mostly for economic reasons, right? The cost of rent is rising. And so one of the things that people were saying to us is, I'm not sure I'm gonna be around long enough to be displaced because of climate change because I'm gonna be displaced by economic issues before that, right? And so really thinking about what our, our resilient strategies are. So like one of the things we ended up doing We've now bought a house in Dorchester um, that we're building, and it will have solar panels and other sets of things to make it resilient. But it also will allow people to be able to afford to stay because we're looking at a, of a rent of like six fifty uh, a month because that matched what we found that like people in our congregation, people in the area, could afford. It doesn't match what the rents are, <laughs> right? Um, and so I think really thinking about how do we not, sometimes climate has been the purview of people who can think about long-term risk because their short-term reality is taken care of. And that means that there's a lot of people who are anxious about climate, but they're actually anxious about other things that are gonna hit them right now. And sometimes the way we do organizing forces them to choose between the thing that they're experiencing right now immediately and the climate risk that they're also experiencing right now immediately, but it's not as pressing to them as like, I'm three months behind on my rent. And so the question is, how can we make people resilient to multiple things that might displace them at the same time? How are we thinking about affordable housing as a climate strategy? And one of the things that we found fascinating is Upham's Corner is the neighborhood, um, one of the neighborhoods that our congregation comes from, and there was an article in the Globe that it's one of the few places in the city where incomes have increased and people haven't been displaced. And part of that is you have a lot of people living in multi-generational housing that actually make those families more resilient. And that's an example, in my opinion, of a resilient strategy because they also consume less. More people in more dense housing will consume less. They will share a lot more. They don't tend to have as many vehicles because they're able to share them. They are living the sharing economy in some really beautiful and powerful ways. So I think we also need to lift up the ways that low-income folk, that people who um, often are immigrants, are living strategies already that are reducing their carbon footprint and making them more resilient? And how do we make it more possible for people to stay in the places that they love in energy efficient homes? When we, when we bundle those together, a lot more people enter the conversation because they don't have to choose between their immediate uh, needs and and climate action. If we can put those two together, there's so many more takers. Thank you for that answer. I, I just wanna say that some of the conversation that the participants will have out uh, after this part is over really sort of resides at this nexus of you know adaptation, mitigation, housing, green space, how we use our public spaces. And it gives me an opportunity to kind of pivot to the other major hazard I think that we, we were gonna talk about tonight, which is extreme heat. Um, we know that extreme heat is one of these cases where, you know, a few decades ago, we didn't think of it as a big risk for us here in Boston. But as the modeling has happened and as we've been experiencing, I, I think this is one of the things where you ask people, they know that this global weirding is happening here in Boston. We're experiencing more uh, and frequent days of these times when it's extremely hot um, and it's impacting people in communities disproportionately. Uh, and so I thought I'd ask Professor Hale, if you could, just to build a little bit on that chart that we saw where you talked about you know, what we're seeing now and what we might expect by, say, 2070 um, or pick your year. What does that look like under different levels of global warming? How is that going to play out for our region depending on what we're able to do to reduce our emissions and, and what we know about the climate system? 
So do you remember the image I showed of the calendar, where it was like June, July, and August? And from the 70s through the 2000s, which most of us were around for part of that at least, I was, um, we had about a week and a half of days over 90 degrees in Boston, and maybe one day over 100 on average. I mean, maybe one year there'd be two or three, maybe the other year there'd be none. On average, one. Now, we're already living in a world where there's multiple weeks over 90 degrees and there's multiple days over 100, and that's already happened. What's going to happen in the future depends on us. Scientists have shown that if we stopped our carbon emissions, global average temperature would stop rising pretty soon afterwards. So what we do matters. I cannot tell you what's going to happen in 2070, because not because I can't predict climate, I can't predict human behavior. How do we change the outcome? We change the outcome by implementing these types of solutions, these win-win-win solutions that help us become more resilient, learning how to swim, that make the drain bigger, and that turn off the hose. So what we know is that if we continue on our current pathway without bending the curve at all, parts of this world could become uninhabitable for humans. Like, you, your body would literally shut down being outside because it was that hot for multiple weeks a year. Not in Boston, but where do you think people are going to move to? So, <laughs> exactly. When Phoenix gets too hot. Right. Phoenix is still growing, but Phoenix has a chief heat officer. Phoenix has some of the top heat researchers in the world at ASU in Phoenix. Phoenix understands that people are already at risk. And if you look at the coverage of what's happening in Phoenix, people are barely being able to physically live without air conditioning. And who can't pay for the air conditioning? Lower income neighborhoods. Who can't plant trees to shade their property? People who live in mobile homes. The inequities on display in Phoenix are soon going to become a feature of life here in Boston if we don't proactively take the work and the steps that you're talking about. So is it going to get worse? It will keep getting worse till we turn off the hose. When we turn off the hose, it'll stop. And then if we make the drain bigger and bigger and bigger, we could even run it backwards a little bit. Not as much as we wish, but at least a little bit. How much worse is it going to get? The answer is just us. How quick are we going to turn off the hose? Thank you. Reverend Chief White Hammond, can you talk a little bit about some of our most important vulnerabilities to heat? We've already touched upon the fact that the urban form of our cities and the persistence of systemic racism and the legacy of how we built our urban spaces is manifesting itself in extreme heat. What do you do about that as an urban planner? Yeah. Um so yeah, I mean, one of the things, if you haven't looked at the city's heat plan, I invite you to just, actually, if you just Google City of Boston heat plan, it actually takes you straight to the page. It's the easiest way. Um, and you know what we find is, for instance, we have some neighborhoods that were zoned in such a way that the sidewalks make it hard to get um, trees there. Uh, so we're looking at, like, what can we do to extend sidewalks? What can we do? I mean, th there may be a need to, when they say parking, that comes from terms where people were using spaces that um, also would have some some flora and fauna around it. And so we're really looking at um, how do we plant more trees, right? They are not gonna. They are not as big of a carbon sink as people sometimes sell them as, but they are amazing for shade, and they do make a big difference in bringing down the temperature um, in in sort of people's experienced temperature in a neighborhood if there's sufficient shade. So really looking at tree planting, and we've been looking both at tree planting on city property, but we also needed to look at tree planting on private property because some of our neighborhoods, it's gonna be very hard. Um, and so actually, we I spent some time in uh, Montreal looking at the program that they created there, and then we created uh, a similar program here. So there's the city program for our land, and then there's the Tree Alliance, um, which we are really excited. We just got $11 million from the US Forest Service as part of um, the uh, Inflation Reduction Act, and part of that, three million of that, is going to bolster some money that the city had already invested from ARPA in this Tree Alliance so that they can go to the neighborhoods where um, 
we do have insufficient canopy and sometimes where we don't have great on-street options to ask neighbors to plant trees in their yard. So that's just one of the things. Um, we also have to look at porous pavement. Um, we've gotten some agreements be, uh, with public works about what we can do around that. But, but in reality, we just have to take down um, all of the things that are sort of heating them up and then increase those things that are helping to cool us down. All of our parks, we're pretty much at this point putting cooling features in all of them. If a park is in a um, heat island, we've said to, like, you cannot rebuild this park without a water feature because this will be a place that people will need to be able to go to and we may need to make sure that's a resource. So we're looking at, it's not one strategy, it's actually a number of different strategies that we're putting on top of each other. But the other big advantage to heat pumps, and we're, I'm not gonna announce anything today, but we, we are having some deep strategies around how we increase heat pumps, because right now, often heat pumps are going to higher income neighborhoods and people who can afford to. We're really trying to look at what we can do to bring them to our neighborhoods that, have, that are heat islands, because, a lot of times that's where our older homes are and they do not have air conditioning. And while I would love to not be burning fossil fuels to do air conditioning, we're really trying to look at, at this point, it is a necessity for people's health and safety to have access to cooling. And so if we can convert people to heat pumps, what's great about them is that they do warm your house, but they also can cool your house. Thank you. And I should say, too, um, that in a city, you don't have any ecosystems to restore or protect because we already cut them down and destroyed them to build everything. So tree planting, where you need to be building an ecosystem, is absolutely essential. And as long as the tree doesn't burn down, it does store that carbon in an amazing way. So you are accomplishing a climate solution as well as all the resilient solutions that you talked about. It's just when you, you know, when you say, oh, I'll burn all the fossil fuels I want and I'll set aside these acres in Colorado to take up carbon for me and then the acres burn down. That's the problem that you hear about with the trees. Um, but when we employ it in this multi, um, multi-functional way, it can just be an incredible aspect. And, and like I mentioned before, um, the trees filter the air, and air pollution is a huge problem, especially in lower income neighborhoods. So there's so many benefits that nature can provide. I think we're just sort of hitting the tip of the iceberg in terms of what happens. Even you know, if you spend 15 minutes outside in nature, they measure changes in your body chemistry as a result of that, um, that improve your well-being, they improve your mental health and your mood. Just learning to live with nature as opposed to against nature, that sort of philosophy that we've had for many hundreds of years, could be completely life-changing. Thank you. I, there's a related question. We're getting towards the end of the time where we're going to get to a few of the audience questions and then let these people go out and have a discussion about um, Boston's heat resilience plan, which we just heard about. Um, there's a particular question, and I think I'm going to use it as an avenue, Chief Webb Hammond, uh, into what it's like to have to think about these things from a planning perspective. Um, someone's asking about something that Somerville, which is one of our neighboring communities, is doing with deep paving. What does that mean for someone like you who has to think about what that means for different kinds of stakeholders and, and you know dealing with business and all the kinds of things that a proposal like that might mean for uh, a city to adopt? Yeah, I mean, I think this is one of the challenges because as an example, um, I, I come from a family of disability activists um, over the last uh, 10 years, my mom, who comes from a family of eight, has lost six of her siblings to a um, debilitating disease that had them all um, in their life in electric wheelchairs. And so I've had to really think about the balance between um, creating as much space for nature, but also making sure that folks with mobility challenges which many of us will be as we age, um, are also able to move around our city um, with a level of independence. And so that's an example of a challenge where you're trying to figure out, um, I would like to reduce pavement, but I also know that pavement makes it easier for people in wheelchairs to get around. I want to get as much housing um, possible, but I also know that that might increase our emissions. How do we find the ways to balance? There are times when um, 
you're trying to find a creative solution that brings a number of things together. I think uh, one of the things we're really trying to do is to start by centering people. And I think uh, for me, I grew up here in the city. Um, I've lived here, except for the four years I was in you know, college, lived here my whole life. And again, really trying to find those win-win solutions that again are about centering people and their needs. Um, and so as an example, one of the things that probably I work on that like most fills my heart is a program we created called Power Core. Uh, it, I went to Philadelphia, my dad is from Philly, so I've spent a lot of time in Philadelphia. Uh, and our former city councilor, now our uh, head of the Boston Housing Authority, Kinsey Bach, said, we've looked at all these programs, we think this one is the best. I looked at some of her research, I said, okay, let's go see this, you know, uh, let's kick the tires, let me see. Uh, and I was blown away. The first person I met, uh, Aaron Kirkland, who's, who is the head of the Green Stormwater Infrastructure Unit for the Philadelphia Water Department. He is a returning citizen who said when he got out of jail, he was very clear, I'm never going back. And the way that that happens is I gotta get the kind of job that allows me to sustain myself and my family. He's now like a water geek and like we look at the maps and he's like, oh, I can print new maps and we're geeking out over like stormwater infrastructure. But anyway, it was a program that was allowing young folk from Philadelphia, mostly black, um, to learn the skills to be the ones doing the work in their own communities. And they, they said after they'd started learning, they started realizing that like, why they were having flooding in their neighborhood sometimes is that the catchment basins weren't always cleared adequately. And they, they now knew how to clear those catchment basins. And so they, one of them was like, I just go and do it in my neighborhood, right? And so I think we want to have great city services. What I love about Power Core is it gives um, young folks access to jobs, good jobs, good paying jobs you can raise a family on. And it allows them to be at the forefront of solving the problems in their own community. And people are willing to sacrifice a little and think a little bit more deeply and consider planting a tree even though it means they're gonna have to rake up those leaves when the person doing that work is a young person from their community who is now employed and is coming to them saying, we need you to be part of the solution um, and I'm willing to help you get there. So I think it isn't always, I don't wanna, we do wanna go for win-win solutions and there are times where there are tough choices. But I think when we value people and invite them into that conversation and the people leading that conversation are often from the communities that have been excluded, I think folks, one, can create more creative solutions and sometimes we're willing to make those sacrifices and those trade-offs when necessary because we really can see ourselves and our communities in that greater good. It's when they are imposed from the outside and people are not consulted that sometimes there can be a pushback because it feels like the solutions are not really for us or they're not from us. Um, and so I, I, I don't wanna pretend like we never have tough situations. We had a park where we had to cut down trees in order to make it handicap accessible, and it was a real battle. But in that instance, I kept thinking about my aunt who lived two blocks from that park and could not use it in the latter part of her life to go walking because it wasn't handicap accessible. And I reminded myself, yes, we are gonna lose some of these trees and everyone's going to be able to benefit from them because we held both the physical accessibility and the climate resilience together. Um, and I think we were able to make the kinds of choices that balanced both. Thank you very much. It's a really nice window into centering people and the choices that we have to make when we think about these resilience strategies and the mitigation strategies that go along with them um, about, as you were saying before, how to make our communities better places, more equitable places to live at the same time as you know, grasping this challenge. My last question um, uh, is, is inspired in some ways by one thing 
that was sent in by by one of our audience members, as well as uh, I'm asking, hoping you can give us some advice as an institution. Uh, so one of the audience members says, a lot of the steps that need to be taken do feel like they need to come from folks in positions of power, for example, city planners. How do you recommend those of us who don't hold those positions of power work to make change as, they try to, as we try to move beyond raising awareness? Is advocacy our best approach? So I'd like you to answer that question. But also, as you heard from our president, Tim Ritchie, next year we're gonna spend an entire year on the idea of an earth shot, that we as a human species can come together to take this challenge on through how we will eat, how we will work, how we will live, how we will move. Um, what advice can you give both someone who's watching online or in the audience about where they can feel that kind of efficacy you were talking about, that kind of agency, and also what the Museum of Science could do? If you could tell us what to do, what would you tell us to do? This is unpaid consulting, I believe. <laughs> Well, um, let me ask you this. So not everyone in your position would be coming in with this drive, this fire, this passion. There's plenty of other people in other towns around the area who might just be sort of doing the job. So what would motivate them to do a bit more that a citizen could do? So I'll say a couple things. Um, so I want to make one plug. I'll leave that for later. But I mean, I think that um, there is climate action to be taken in every space. And there are many people, for instance, that, that have to have public meetings and nobody shows up. Yeah. So I think one of the things to think about is where are the places for action that you think nobody else is showing up to, right? Like how many people are going to the public works meetings about the trash contract? Maybe not so many people. It's just not very sexy, right? Um, so I think that one of the things that, that citizens can do is really think about um, where are untapped places that climate action could happen. And I think to start by being real about the constraints, because sometimes people come in like as if I have like an unlimited budget and like whatever I want to do, I can just like say it and it's going to happen. And so I think. Do you, if you're working with people particularly that are not maybe necessarily motivated to do community engagement on their own, listening always works. Like start by listening, then people are actually far more likely to listen to you if they feel like you've really heard them out. Um, and I think that's a strategy not just working with public officials. That's a strategy that generally works with humans. Um, and sometimes people forget that we are public officials, that we are humans. We are not like the Wizard of Oz. We are people trying to figure out. And sometimes the thing you're asking for, I asked for it too. I just didn't get it in my budget line out of last year. Right? You know, so I think um, if you assume that this person actually does want to do the best job, most public servants are choosing to do it because we like serving constituents. We could do it in the private sector in some instances. We choose not to because we like to be closer to it. If you start from the assumption that the person is in this role because they really want to deliver excellent service, as opposed to like they're secretly trying to make climate change continue, which sometimes people do approach you as if that's who you are, um, like I have some moments where young white people will tell me about equity and I'm like, it's really hard for, like I wanna hear you, but I've been working on this, like not because I learned about it in the class last year. So like can we have a dialogue that assumes best intentions on both of our sides and then let's try to come up with some solutions. Cause there are some things that you can do that they can't do. There are things that you can say that we can't say. There are places that you can show up and advocate that someone who's in the role can't advocate in the same way, right? There are challenges we have with the state that you may actually have a better job unsticking than we do, right? And so I think really asking, how do we create a partnership where you take the fact that, or I take the fact that I'm working on this, you know, every day all the time, and have some access to data 
and you take the fact that you're way more free to talk freely in a lot of other spaces and push some folks, and how do we use the comparative advantages that both of us have to try to uh, get to this ultimate goal? The one other thing I wanna say is environmental justice is about an equal sharing of the benefits and the burdens. And I need folks, particularly in the suburban communities, to start raising their hands to take on their fair share of the burdens. Because sometimes you have people coming, as an example, we have a substation in East Boston. People coming out in solidarity with East Boston, great. But did you know that Brookline only has one substation? So when it votes, for instance, to increase its electrification under the current structure, that could mean more substations in Boston. I'm all for Brookline electrifying. And it should raise its hand and take on that electrical infrastructure and not ask Boston to take it on, because that would exacerbate already existing inequalities. And so I do need folks who are in communities that have disproportionate environmental benefits to start being willing to take on the burdens that you have sometimes outsourced to communities like Boston and Lowell and um, New Bedford. That kind of justice is absolutely necessary in our movement and sparse. Well, so, so just to recap, what I heard you saying, if this is correct, is people can be partners. If you can approach an elected official with an open mind, with the ability to listen, and then ask, how could, you par how could I partner with you? How could I support you? There's things, like you were saying, that people can do that you can't do. So there are partnerships that could be formed that together could accomplish a lot more than any, anybody could individually. Absolutely. Uh -huh. And there are examples. Our community choice electricity in the city of Boston, yes, we've worked really hard on it, but residents demanded it. Mm -hmm. And there are some changes that need to happen in the Department of Public Utilities that I am certainly working on, but I wish some residents would also challenge them because they need to do better. They keep, some communities have applied to have community choice electricity a long time ago, and they're waiting. Why does it take three years to process these people's application? I think people need to look, Department of Public Utilities needs to serve the public before the utilities. And very few people in the public even know who they are or show up to their meetings. If you show up to their meetings, there's not that many people there, so you will be noticed. So there's an even added benefit, which is finding out what you can do. Because everything you're describing, I had no idea about any of those things. Now, granted, I don't live in Boston, but I, I don't have any idea where this, in the city where I live of any of those things. Now I'm going to be looking into them. You, you, you probably got one. Yeah. You got some utility sure. regulation group that nobody pays attention to. In Texas, it's the Railroad Commission. The things the Railroad Commission runs, you would not believe. And <laughs> everybody's just like, the railroad, that's like from the 1900s. So I, think, I think ISO New England is meeting this week. That's our electric grid. Most, maybe you didn't know we share an electric a grid across New England. And I think this week, the head of the Federal Energy um, Regulation Council, FERC, is that the right? Anyway, FERC, I always call him FERC. I think he's in town. It's technically a public meeting. I believe you're allowed to go to it. The number of citizens that show up, not that high, yeah. which means that each of your voices makes a pretty big difference when you come. So where's a clearinghouse that people can find this information from? Like, it, are there citizen groups that collect this information? Like, how would you find out more? Yeah, so I think in the case of ISO, there's a group that actually I think organized to, they had a ratepayer like, task force that they were supposed to listen to, and I think a bunch of climate activists just ran to get onto that ratepayer um, task force because in the past, that task force was always talking about how to keep prices low, and now you have a, a group of people who are, they do care about price, but they also care about climate. And they're trying to get um, our grid to 
again, we're not saying we want prices to skyrocket, but cheap electricity now is gonna be extremely expensive later if everything's burning up. So what I'm hearing then, if I can translate that to your question, which is what the museum can do, is crowdsourcing really makes a difference. How many employees do you have at the museum? About 300. 300. That's a lot of ideas there. So if they can find out, like you just told people, average citizens can also, if your employees could be empowered to surface ideas on how to do things better, more effectively, more efficiently, you could end up with this amazing slate of possibilities. Well, and I bet you you do things like demystify how electricity works. The question is, could you also tell people, and this is who regulates it, <laughs> right? Because it doesn't just get to your house randomly. Here's who brings it if you're in this region. Here's who brings it if you're, if you're in this region. And here who, is, who oversees them no matter where you are in the state. You know, because I think understanding the science and understanding the politics, I think would help people get more creative, creative about where they can take action. Thank you very much. And, and that kind of turn, allows me to turn things over to the people in the audience, because what's going to happen next is we have an opportunity for people to discuss some of these difficult choices that we've talked about and the opportunities that we have at our hands uh, to be able to make our spaces better while addressing climate change. Before I do that, though, I, I just want to say uh, our president, Tim Ritchie, framed this as the kickoff for this year of Earthshot that's coming. The truth is, I could argue that it happened two months ago. And it happened when your boss, Mayor Wu, called us up and asked if she could sign the building stretch code um, that uh, Reverend White Hammond has, has put into play, we're not here, we're actually in Cambridge right now, but it's across the river on the other side of our building, um, uh, has put into, into effect. And um, that is an opportunity, right? That's an opportunity to facilitate a conversation. It's an opportunity to get people involved in discussions like where substations should be cited or how we can change the way that we use open space as yeah. we address the climate challenge. Um, so we want to give people an opportunity to do that. And in a moment, we're going to give you a chance to, to go into the Blue Wing. There are some refreshments, and you'll be able to have conversations with the other people who are here. Uh, before I do that, though, obviously, I, I have to thank some people. First of all, I want to thank the Nature Conservancy, the City of Boston, and the Canadian Consulate for making tonight happen. Um, it's a really interesting conversation, uh, and, and it's just the start, I think, of what needs to happen for us to address this challenge here in Boston. Uh, but I also want to thank these amazing human beings. I feel hopeful knowing that there are both solutions at hand and people who are willing to have this conversation and bring it to others. Um, so let's thank our fantastic speakers tonight. So what's going to happen now is we'll bring the lights up, um, and we're going to direct you to the Blue Wing. Uh, you can have uh, conversations there. Um, there'll be some light refreshments. Um, I hope you have a wonderful evening, uh, and uh, thank you so much for being here. <laughs>